My research has predominantly been gender history uh, than the history of sexuality. Queer history, the history of queer movements, uh, disability and sexuality, the history of, etc. So that's my field, the history of sexuality, you might say. I think the most significant contributions in my field uh, have been the understanding of sexual orientation, sexual identities, or and also of, of gender identities, being a man or a woman, how they are changing over history. And that's obvious. I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree that it's very, very different to, to be a woman today in Sweden, say, than it was two, three hundred years ago, things are changing and people think about gender differently in different times. If we take uh, homosexuals, which was a category that didn't exist before, but why did they burn sodomites at the stake uh, two, three hundred years ago? Why don't they do that today? How come uh, same-sex sexuality has been so much accepted in many places, not in all, all and not by everybody, I don't, I'm not saying that, but that gays and lesbians have actually gained some recognition recognition and some rights in rather important parts of the world. Adultery was punishable by death 200 years ago, and how, how come it is not? Why didn't women, women have the right to vote, like until fairly recently? And what happened when they got the right to vote? Did that change with the world? How did it happen when they got it? Who's, was it their struggle? Was it social change in any way, other ways, or economical change? These are so important questions that concern everybody in humanity, actually. I think that nowadays the most significant global change we see today is the the transgender turn in culture in politics legislation etc and to look back the Judeo-Christian religion has been very, very negative to any kind of gender bending or crossing gender boundaries of, of questioning what is, is to be a man or a woman. There are stories that the European conquistadors killed all the Native Americans they found. They considered what we would today call transgender people because in other cultures there have been, in not all cultures, but in many cultures there have been a place for intersex individuals, transgender people in, in different ways. So what's happening now? Since the last 20 years or so in the Western world and globally, more and more people say that, no, we want you to rewrite the laws. We want you to make room for us in society because we are there. We are the people who are not comfortable with your kind of gender sort of division between the genders and definition of what it is to be a man or a woman or your, your insistence on that, that you must be either a man or a woman. So I think that is the most pressing research question right now. What will happen with this and what, how will that influence society, our institutions, our thoughts, our way of thinking about politics, about culture, about child rearing, what have you. And some people think that these changes are because a small number of queer scholars are sitting in their chambers writing very difficult texts about it. And of course it's not that way. That, this comes from somewhere else. This is something happening now that the queer scholars are trying to understand. But of course I do have a political agenda. I think all, all good researchers want to change the world with their research. And of course I want my research to be used to make the world a pl better place. And actually I am rather optimistic because if I look at my own life, when I grew up there were military dictatorships all over Southern Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa. And I don't think that the world is perfect now, but it's so much better than it was when I grew up in the 60s, 70s. I do think, I do see that there are a lot of problems now. There are, there are sort of populist movements on the march. There are, are sort of challenges to liberal democracy, to, to gay and lesbian rights, etc., transgender rights. But I take comfort in that most people are not fascists that historically no fascist party have ever got more than, let's, let's say, 32% of the votes, I believe it was in Germany in 1933, uh, in a reasonably um, democratic election. So uh, the 70%, the, all the other 70% could sort of agree on what, what we think is, are the most important things and pull a little bit on the same direction. I think we're, the world will become better, actually. I work in the field of risk and disaster studies. Uh, and if we look at both the risks, how we think about abstract things, and we move all the way through the abstract risk to the concrete disaster, gender is per present through all of these stages. 
start with the risk and risk perception. We know that men and women, girls and boys, experience risks differently, both in the sense that we perceive different risks, but also in the sense that we are exposed to risk or have increased or decreased probabilities of a risk uh, happening to us. Uh, for example, if you look at, uh, in our part of the world, in, uh, in Europe, uh, the risk of being killed in a traffic accident or being the cause of a traffic accident is much higher for men than it is for women. And that means when it comes to those specific risks, uh, men are more exposed. And it also means that men are more likely to die in a traffic accident than women are. If we look at the perception of risk, maybe then women perceive risks in a different way than men because we live in a different reality, if you will, uh, than men do. This is true for risks when it comes to our personal safety. Women are more exposed or more likely to experience sexual violence than men are. And that means that we adjust, that women adjust their lives in a different way than men do to minimize the risk of this. And when we talk about risk and risk perception, uh, the, div the distinction between an objective risk, that is how we can measure it and how we can uh, try to prevent something bad from happening, is different from the way that we perceive the subjective risk. To me, there's no difference between the objective and the subjective risk, because we know that it will affect the way we behave and the way we move around in the world. So if there is a difference between men and women when it comes to risk perception, they will have different lives. They will choose to walk down the street uh, at different times. They will feel satisfied with life or experience a sense of freedom in different ways. Therefore, gender is very central to me when it comes to risk perception. In disaster preparedness, there's also a gender dimension. For me, the link is between how we perceive the world and what we do to handle the risks we're exposed to. And if we look globally, uh, the frequency and the severity of disasters is increasing. That means that we are doing things on a societal level to mitigate and to adapt to the negative consequences. And this certainly has a gender dimension. Uh, let me give you a few examples on how disasters affect men and women differently. Uh, if there's a wildfire, chances are that the man will stay at the house to protect his home to a great extent and will not evacuate in time. That means the likelihood of men dying in wildfires is much, much greater than it is for women. This is one example of when disasters affect men in a more negative way than women. If we look at other disasters, such as the effects of climate change that are very slow onset and they're a kind of a creeping disaster, it doesn't have a clear beginning and it doesn't have a clear end. The situation for women in some parts of the world it's much more, is much more difficult than it is for men. For example, in some parts of the world, men will migrate to find work because the climate change has affected their region to such an extent that they can't provide for their families. So they will leave their families and search for work. And that means that the women are left behind in a place where there are no possibilities for them to earn a living. They're also responsible for the children and in many cases for the elderly. It might also be that they're responsible for the few livestock animals that the family has. And as we know from our part of the world, uh, the division of labor is also gendered. That means that women do more of the unpaid work. And for us in Western societies, that's a challenge. But for women in other parts of the world, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a challenge because they have less opportunities to provide for themselves and their families. So in disasters, we see a clear gender dimension for both men and women, but it affects us differently. I work in the field of risk and disaster studies. And for me, the point of our research is to save lives. It's to minimize the negative consequences of a disaster, minimize a risk of someone being hurt. And without a gender dimension, we can't understand how risks and disasters affect people differently. And that means that we can't save and protect the, the most amount of lives. And that's the point of the research. So without gender, we can't do our jobs to the best of our abilities. My research uh, revolves around the issue of uh, family life and uh, intimate relations with a particular focus on China. Gender matters in my field of research because it offers a, a critical lens through which one can study inequalities and power relations, uh, and not only between women and men, uh, but also in terms of structural inequalities and multiple sources of inequalities, uh, where class matters, ethnicity, age, generation, sexuality, and so on. Uh, I studied uh, the phenomenon of son preference, uh, which means that families, uh, some families in the Chinese context prefer sons over daughters. 
Uh, and when st while studying that, it became very obvious to me that to look at that as a gender issue is not enough, but it's ex absolutely necessary to also include a generational uh, perspective and see how generation, gender and class uh, interact with one another and, and continue to reinforcing and reproducing this institution of some preference. However, when understanding and explaining some preference is not enough to only look at it from an individual or family level perspective, but one also has to look at it from a structural perspective. So it's important to look at how policies, for example, uh, influence the family and the decisions that family makes. Uh, and in the Chinese context, of course, the one-child policy has been very important. But it's also important to look at how, for example, the labor market is structured uh, and which social policies and pension policies are available. Because at the end of the day, all these things will impact how the, the family is organized, both socially and economically. Well, one of the most important contributions that gender studies have uh, made to my field of research is uh, uh, to put feminist theory in dialogue with demographic studies. Uh, which is sort of bordering family sociology and my research interests. And scholars like uh, Susan Greenhog and Nancy E. Riley have called for demographers and family sociologists to go beyond uh, feminist empiricism, which is very important in itself. It, it uh, implies that you add, uh, you know, you, you disaggregate data by sex, for example, or you, um, uh, you add uh, women as, a, as a, a category to your research. And that's very important in itself, but we need to move beyond that and think of how do the models and the measures and the categories that we work with, uh, you know, what, what uh, power relations are embedded in them, uh, how are we maybe concealing some power relations and maybe even contributing to preserving some uh, inequalities by sticking to, to the status quo. So as uh, feminist scholars, uh, we need to stand constantly uh, question and reflect and think about how uh, we as researchers and our research and our concepts uh, can contribute in nuancing and analyzing uh, the world in more critical ways. So the, uh, the importance of being critical and scrutinize the underlying assumptions uh, in our research has been particularly, that insight has been particularly useful uh, when I've studied the so-called marriage squeeze uh, in the Chinese context. And marriage squeeze is a demographic term that denotes the, the numeric imbalance between women and men. So if there are more men than women, for example, we have a male marriage squeeze because allegedly there will be too few women for men to marry. But if you scrutinize this assumption and this sort of measure uh, from a critical gender perspective, you can easily see that, well, actually, uh, this marriage squeeze concept rests upon the idea that, first of all, uh, you know, everyone is a woman or a man. Like, it's a, it's a binary understanding of sex, uh, which gender studies and anthropolo anthropology uh, have for a long time uh, questioned whether this is so for everyone. Uh, secondly, it rests on the assumption that everybody wants to marry uh, somebody of the opposite sex, uh, so it's a heteronormative concept. And uh, it also rests on the assumption that everybody wants to get married, which we also know from many uh, contexts of the world, both historically and contemporarily, that that's not the case. Uh, so there are these sort of underlying assumptions uh, that that are not as stable as we like to think. And, and fourthly, uh, and also maybe most interestingly from a sociological point of view, you know, whether or not we have a, a numeric imbalances between women and men is, is not enough to create a marriage squeeze, actually. Uh, and this is the case under two uh, scenarios or two, two, two conditions which China currently is facing. And one of them is that a sort of a culture or, or a pattern or a norm uh, that marriages should be formed between a, a woman and a man where the man hold higher socioeconomic status. This is what we call hypergamy. So if women ha marry hypergamously, that means that uh, men at the bottom uh, of the socioeconomic uh, pyramid, if you like, uh, tend to fall outside of the marriage market, whereas women at the higher end also tend to fall out. Uh, so you can effectively, if you have a, a very classed society where inequalities are very large, uh, then you're likely to have a situation where men uh, typically, uh, in m remote and rural areas, uh, ha find it hard to find a partner. And you have m women, uh, mostly in urban areas, and who are well-educated and maybe hold uh, good jobs. And then it's harder for them to find a, a man in this hypergamous uh, expectation that is often placed on that. So in China, yes, we have, a, we have a problem that there are too many men and there are too few women. But there are also massive problems with inequalities, both regionally, uh, but also between you know, in individuals in terms of income and wealth distribution. Uh, so, so it's it's not only about numbers. Uh, it's all, it's about how how gender is constructed. It's about how sexuality is constructed, and it's about how a society is classed that implicates how uh, unions or forms and marriages are made.
the most important contribution of feminist and gender research in political economy has been to visibilize the invisible labor. And as Nancy Fraser would call it, the hidden abode of production. And this invisible labor is mostly done by women, migrants, and people who are involved in social reproduction. And social reproduction involves activities such as housekeeping, care work, taking care of elders and children. Without these activities, the economy would not be able to function because it will not have productive, healthy workers. My research deals with work in the informal economy. It is often called the shadow economy or the gray economy. People who work in the informal economy do not have social securities, such as a regular income, uh, health benefits, or sick leave or parental leave. I'm interested in looking at the material and immaterial value that workers in informal economy create. Even though it may seem that the informal economy is far away from the formal economy, it is actually an important part of national and transnational economies. Today, as the capitalist economy is structured, Care and social reproduction is often outsourced and privatized, which results in a chain of care work and caregivers who are mostly women, migrants, and people coming from underprivileged classes who provide care services for the privileged classes. Now, with rapid globalization and rise of technology, uh, gender scholarship reminds us that everything we own and everything we use on a daily basis is not only produced, assembled and shipped from all across the globe, but it is often also produced under harsh conditions, is gendered and exploitative. Even though it may seem that we are living in a post-colonial political era, uh, the production machinery is very much based on neocolonial lines. So, for example, the Global South produces more and the Global North consumes more. And then the Global South recycles what the Global North consumes. Um, so, in that sense, it's very much like the colonial times um, because the Global South is a big market for Northern brands and it is also a source of resource extraction. Feminist and gender studies intervention into political economy has shaped the welfare state. Feminist struggles have been responsible for equal wages, uh, parental leave, uh, state-funded childcare and kindergartens, and gender studies scholars have consistently shown the limits of austerity and how it affects women and minority groups more than others. Though the capitalist economy may seem and may appear to be merit-based, more and more data shows that one's gender, sexuality, able-bodiedness, class and caste can factor into recruitment processes and then it also shapes the social dynamics at workplace. Gender matters in my field, which is economic history, because it's the mo one of the most important dimensions of inequality in income, wealth, and well-being. Gender is essential for understanding as to whether labor market differences depend on productivity differentials or discrimination. But it's also important for understanding what people bring to the labor market in terms of education and experience. Since gender is a changing concept, over time it parallels with changes in the economy. If we, for example, apply a gender perspective to the Industrial Revolution, which is central to economic history, we see that it meant different things for men and women. Industrialization most certainly established the male breadwinner norm through the separate spheres, with men dominating the public and women dominating the private spheres. 
but it also created occupational segregation with men holding different jobs than women, determining the relative value of their time. If we apply a long-term historical perspective to industrialization, we see that it has had different implications for men and women even into this very day. In pre-industrial times, work and family was compatible for both men and women. But with industrialization and the separation of work from home, women had to choose. First, this choice was about either or, either work or family. Then it became a sequential decision with women first working, then focusing on family, and eventually returning to work. Today, the choice is not so much about either or, but rather about combining work and family for both men and women. Gender differences have diminished and changed, but they persist even in seemingly gender neutral societies as contemporary Sweden. I've studied gender differences in labor market outcomes in past and present times. I've also studied while women made so many advancements in the public sphere over the past century, the advances of men in the private sphere has been so slow in Sweden and in other countries. This imbalanced development of increased gender equality actually created new gender inequities. Important questions is how do we get at a more gender equal division of labor? If men do more paid work and women do more unpaid work, then we get income differentials with implications for men's and women's well-being. The fact that individual women shoulder the major part of the costs of childbearing, childrearing, and other caregiving activities, while society gains a lot from the value of these activities, makes it a very important policy question. Gender matters in my field of research, which is law, uh, because Law is about human relationships. Law is one of the institutions in society that governs human relations, and human relationships are gendered. I think that introducing gender into legal scholarship is basically about acknowledging that law is interconnected with uh, socioeconomic structures in society. Research in law with a gender studies perspective has made us aware of uh, this kind of simple fact I mean, that it uh, affects women and men differently, has challenged uh, the co conception of law as being objective, neutral. It's not only about the outcome of the laws. Adding a gender perspective into legal scholarship could also be about and challenging or make visible gendered aspects of legal subjects, such as the defendant or the consumer or the employee. I think that the importance of gender can be difficult to see. In the global West, and certainly in the Nordic countries, we have this self-image of, um, for example, Sweden, then, uh, of being um, a gender equal country. I think that in Sweden, gender equality is very central to the national self-image. It can also be difficult to make visible or to see um, the gendered structures in society because we take them for granted. So a challenge for gender studies in law has been to develop new theories, new methods to kind of grasp the underlying assumptions of um, legal regulations, for example, or for, uh, the, the assumptions underlying legal provisions. In my subdiscipline, which is criminal law, one of the perhaps most important contributions is just to make visible the simple fact that criminality is very much interrelated with masculinity. To give you a figure of how masculinity and criminality is interrelated, in 2008, 80% of the suspects of uh, a crime 
were men. And when it comes to sexual offenses, persons being suspect of uh, uh, sexual offense, the figure is, the, the number is uh, uh, 98%. These figures can, of course, have many different explanations. The point I want to make is that we need to acknowledge these figures um, when doing research in criminal law. Acknowledging that uh, gender and criminality is interrelated can, can make us find new research topics. For example, we could uh, think about uh, the rules on self-defense. What kind of situations are, in, in what kind of situations are men mostly uh, exposed to violence compared to situations where most women are exposed to violence? And does the regulation on self-defense work similarly in both these situations? I would say that uh, studies of gender and gender relations are really central to what I do, and they actually have been for, well, about 40 years now. And if I think about the areas that I've been involved in, I think there are three really big areas. Um, the first one is really around gender and organisations and you know, how gender works within workplaces, uh, within factories, within, within universities even. Right? And that is a sort of fairly obvious, I think, issue. And within that, we've focused particularly on sexuality, actually, which has been, I still think, neglected. And it, that includes sexual harassment, obviously, but not only sexual harassment, because there are many other aspects of what you might call sexual processes of dynamics that go on within organisations and workplaces, in management, in advertising, and so on and so forth. The second area is what I would label critical studies on men and masculinities, and this is much broader in some ways. In one sense, you could say it applies or is relevant for everything, you know, from really very obvious everyday issues about what it means to be a boy or a good boy or a real man or not a real man, through to very Big questions, especially in universities, about what counts as knowledge, for instance, you know, where knowledge comes from, the history of knowledge, the history of academia, the history of the classics, um, is a lot to do with men and masculinities. The third area is violence, and that also actually follows on, and I've, I've been thinking a long time, it's very hard to study men and masculinities without actually studying violence in some way. And within that, I would say the initial focus was very much on violence against women and children. Um, interpersonal violence, but as think time has gone on, as I've got older, um, I've become more interested in other kinds of violence. And if I take that last area of violence, one of the things that's become a really important question in the last 20 years or a bit more perhaps, is looking at the implications of, let's call it ICTs, Information and Communication Technologies, online violence, cyber violence, cyber abuse online stalking, these kind of things. So, for example, I've done a book recently with a colleague, Matthew Hall, on revenge pornography. It's a really bad term, revenge pornography, for various reasons. It should be called something like sharing sexual texts and images online without consent, but it's the term that's used popularly. So that has been a change in that direction towards looking at online phenomena, on online violence and sexual violence. In terms of men and masculinities, that's also changed in the last 20 years, in my, in my mind. There's been a move, and this has affected my work a lot, from doing local studies, ethnographic studies, so-called, looking at issues transnationally, and what I would call transnational patriarchies. Patriarchies aren't just local or national. They operate, I don't know, across Europe, in big business, in international politics, even in the university world. And then the third area, which I mentioned around gender and sexuality and organisations, that also has developed and changed over the last, say, 20 years or so in terms of my research. I mean, it's, it's always been there, which is in terms of looking much more closely at gender in relation to age. I'm working as a professor of physics and I've done that for almost 30 years and for the last 15 years I've also been involved more and more in, in what we could call gender science and as for many people it starts with equality and equal opportunity and then it moves on to actually wondering what's going on and for us in the STEM fields, which is science, technology, engineering and medicine and mathematics, it's very clear that something is a screw.
something is uh, problematic. We have a, in history and in present case, and especially in decision making, a, a big imbalance and a big domination of men. And a very interesting research question is why? You can just ask you the question, why is it that most in favor and think about themselves as objective are also the ones that are most gendered? So it's a question that I've been asking myself for a long time. And doing that leads to, of course, uh, thinking about numbers and pr trying to improve the numbers, trying to recruit, trying to change the segregated society I live in, in, in engineering and in science but also then looking at the culture. What is going on? How do physis physicists and mathematicians behave together? How do they organize themselves? And what is going on in the interaction about, between people? That seems to be pushing away or not attracting women as much, or minorities as much as men, men looking like me. And this is a very intense uh, uh, field where a lot of research is going on and also the questions become more and more involved. One can say one starts with, as I say, with the numbers, asking about why the, and how do the numbers look like, do they change? Going into the culture, as I explained, how do we, uh, people interact in these fields? And going down to the mo most interesting and newest form, how are the science and technology created? And what kind of science and technology and research do we do? We are from different origins, so to speak, or if we are men and women. And how does it affect the science? How does it affect what physics we do, for example, depending on the fact that it's only been produced by men, basically? So th this is uh, what I'm worrying about. That's my research question. And I should also say, I most of all find my position here as the person trying to understand a field which is a field that is based on sociology, gender science, humanities, and explain it to my fo fellows uh, in, uh, in science, natural science and engineering in a way so it makes sense for us, because of course the, the language and the epistemology, the, the way we do things are very different, and what is knowledge, even that could be very different in the two fields. In my own research as a media historian, I have used media sources, uh, mostly popular culture in, in the shape of, of journals uh, and feature films actually study the structures, the discourses that framed the existence for ordinary people in a certain uh, time, and that has been mostly Sweden in the beginning of the 20th century. When I focus on, on the language and, and imagery uh, in, in those popular cultural sources, uh, my point of departure is that uh, popular culture is always keeping very close to their audiences for commercial reasons. They want to sell papers, they want to have blockbuster films. And, and then they really get us really close to the experience and identities of ordinary people in those days, the discourses that really governed their everyday living. So it's a great source material. And then I study not, not just gender, but also class and, and how the two work together. What I've been focusing very much on is female workers or the female working class or the lower classes in Sweden. And what I found is a, a little, um, well, uh, surprising perhaps. Working class women or lower class women in Sweden uh, during the 20th century, in the, the first half of it, was actually used as role models to other classes. They were really um, admired for their thrift their Lutheran work ethics, uh, their contentment with their social position or circumstances. And in many films, for instance, they were used as mediators between the classes. And then they were really negotiating a new kind of ideology, namely, as it turned out, the ideology in complex ways of, of the new welfare state. So that, in turn, have um, made me uh, question uh, older working class history, older narratives of class for being obviously too inherently male, 
uh, too inherently polemic. Class can also be about outstretched hands, about negotiation, and it can be very complex when it works together with gender. As a nurse, uh, gender status matters in quite many ways. Uh, nursing is a, an old profession and it's been dominated by, by women for, for decades. And in the beginning, uh, nursing was a, a vocation. It was, wasn't just a job, an ordinary job. You wanted to be, become a nurse and you didn't want to, to get paid because you should go, do it for your beliefs. I mean, it was connected to, to the church and Christianity and so on. And it was uh, a profession with high status, uh, despite having a low salary or no salary at all. A lot of, of uh, women that came from, from rich families that wanted to become, become nurses uh, didn't get paid and so on. And that has been a foundation for, for the profession. And even though every, a lot of things have changed over the years, I think that still affects how the profession uh, is viewed in, in, in media and how we look at our own profession as well. My research around uh, this area of gender uh, is related to how uh, and why nurses and social workers uh, leave their profession or why they change uh, workplace. We have seen in, in Europe there is a lack of nurses and lack of social workers and there's a, a lot of uh, nursing turnover that they, they are doing something else after a while. They, they have their three-year uh, uh, education and they be become a, a registered nurse and work for a few years and then they, they take a totally different employment for doing something else. I have friends that become uh, engineers instead because they got sick of being a nurse, they didn't like the, the working environment, they didn't like their leadership and so on. But we have very little knowledge about why they leaving their profession or why they're leaving uh, a workplace. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people being at their workplace for just a few years and then they leave. Historically, I think that nurses were very loyal to their workplace, that they started at the ward and they, they worked there for 30 years and then they retired and that's it. Uh, now people work for a few years and then they change because they, I don't know if they're bored or if they don't like the situation there and they move on to another place. Uh, and you have a constantly drain of knowledge with experienced nurses that leaving the ward for another ward uh, and the ward had to, to uh, teach new nurses how to do, run things at their specific ward and, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of, of money of course as well. There's a big interest of, of knowledge in how to keep nurses working not only as nurses uh, but to keep them at, at uh, the same ward as well. We know also that there's a lot of situation with mass resignation uh, that uh, we have wards for instance with 30 nurses and suddenly 25 of them are resigning. It's interesting to, to see what made them resign at that specific time point. And, and I mean, even though there's been poor working environment situation, it's been probably been so there for, for quite a few years, but suddenly enough is enough and, and the nurses resign. Why at that situation? And, and what are the, th the factors that, that make them do it at that specific time point? Uh, so we're not just uh, looking at uh, the bad factors, what making the nurses leave, but also trying to give good example about leadership and working environment and, and so on to see what make nurses stay. What could we could we give good examples of how things should be done uh, to keep the nurses and social workers to to stay in their profession. Uh -huh.